Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for your warm welcome. It's great to be here with you this morning. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this extraordinary moment which transformed the lives of Jesus' disciples, which showed them to him, risen from the dead. We thank you for all that flowed from that moment, from one to another and through generations beyond, and which affects us 2,000 years later in this room, so far away. We pray, Lord, that you would, uh, by your Spirit, open my mouth to speak your word this morning, Open our ears to hear it and our minds to understand and our hearts to respond with the same uh, joy and gladness and commitment of those first disciples. So, come Holy Spirit, speak with us today. Reveal your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Well, I gather that you read the same passage last week, um, for which my apologies, I didn't realise that until it was too late. But then, according to uh, St John's Gospel, Jesus himself met with his disciples in the upper room again a week later. So I suppose I've got good precedent for joining you all this morning and the disciples in the upper room. When I was at university, uh, the curate at our church ate a daffodil on Easter Sunday morning. The idea was that we would be able to say, when we went home, you'll never believe what I saw this morning. But it's true. Well, that became quite a, a favourite Easter illustration for curates for some time. But before I got ordained, one such enthusiastic preacher got a very serious case of tetanus from eating his daffodil, and the enthusiasm for that illustration faded away amongst later generations of curates. So let me try something safer. Here is a club biscuit. I gather some of you really like club biscuits, is that right? So <coughs> let me just check with you. This is a real club biscuit, isn't it? If I open this up, you can see club biscuit inside, can't you? If I break it, that's definitely club biscuit. Okay, so this is a real club biscuit, and if I eat it, oh, there's left of it. It's disappearing. Here it for the camera. Here is a club biscuit that is getting smaller as I eat it. Oh, it's all gone. Sorry about that. And here's a glass of orange squash. Is this full? Is this glass of orange squash full? Yes. Oh, there's orange squash here. Okay. So if I drink the orange squash. I just go to my witness. Not so full anymore. Empty. So I've drunk the orange squash, I've eaten the club biscuit and they've disappeared, okay? That's what happens when you eat and drink. Jesus' disciples had seen Jesus arrested, dragged away. Some of them had been brave enough to follow him into the courtyard where the trial was and had been pushed around by the guards. Others had followed Jesus carrying his cross and been manhandled by the soldiers. They had seen hammers nailed home into his wrists, into his hands. They had seen how that had racked Jesus' body with pain. They had seen the spear thrust home into his side. And then they had handled his dead body. They had seen where he was buried. They knew that he was dead. 
So here they are in their upper room, hiding away, terrified that they're going to be next. They're behind locked doors. They are shattered, grief-stricken, dreams dashed, and their beloved friend is, is dead. They've got regrets for the past, and they've got fears for the future. I just wonder whether you relate to any of that. And then people started reporting in. Some women had seen that the tomb was empty. So had Peter and John. Mary Magdalene said she'd seen Jesus alive again. Impossible. But now Cleopas and his friend have just arrived breathless from Emmaus, where they'd sat down to eat with a stranger who turned out to be Jesus. Unbelievable. But suddenly, Jesus himself is standing here with them, despite no one having opened the door, which was bolted. How could this be? Was he a ghost? A hallucination? We love to think that we would do better than the disciples. They'd been with Jesus three years, watching the impossible daily, and alerted in advance to this very moment, death being defeated. But honestly, we've got just the same responses today. We know from our own experience that when someone dies, they stay dead. We'd love to believe that life could be rekindled from the ashes, hurts could be healed, guilt washed away, sins forgiven, purpose renewed. But life isn't like that. It's too overpowering, too confusing, too dark. What hope is there for us? When Jesus stepped into that upper room, he touched the disciples at each of these points. First of all, he confronts their sense of unreality. This moment is real, and he gives them proof. His, his presence is not just spiritual or emotional. He really is there in bodily form. His body makes an impact on the world. His body still bears the marks of suffering and execution. They can touch him, and they do. If he eats something, it disappears. This is the most physically real moment in their lives, which changes and transforms all the rest of their reality. Because Jesus lives, we know that there is life beyond death. Crucifixion is swept away by resurrection. We can let go of fear. Peace be with you, Jesus declares to them. In all the anxieties, the wickednesses, the terrors of this world, we can experience Jesus' peace. Secondly, Jesus comforts their grief. Yes, he was dead and they were bereaved. But now, he is, he is here with them once again, in their upper room, sharing their meal, sharing their emotions, sharing their life, sharing his love for them. Luke says, they still didn't believe it because of joy and amazement. John puts it slightly differently in his gospel. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. When the Lord steps back into our life, we can embrace joy once again. Perhaps it will catch us in a rush, unawares. Perhaps it will be a quiet, tentative acceptance that joy can be ours once more. Thirdly, Jesus explains this moment through scripture. This isn't an accident. This is what God has been planning all along. The disciples are part of the Father's unending purposes, hidden until then, but now unwrapped. On the outside, it might look like a gold foil-wrapped Easter bunny, but inside, it's a man crucified, risen from the dead, a man who is God, who takes our death and offers us his life. Your guilt is forgiven, your shame is removed, your shackles are loosed, you are reconciled with God, you are invited into an eternity of blessing and joy with the Father. There is hope for us all, after all. 
And fourthly, Jesus gives them back their purpose. You are my witnesses, he says. You saw the daffodil, the biscuit, the broiled fish, eaten and consumed. You know that I am alive. Tell your friends, tell the world. They were demoralised, but now they are motivated and mobilised once again. And we, here this morning, are included in their commission. We have a world-changing purpose from Jesus. Jesus offers them, fifthly, his power. The power that raised him from the dead. Wait and receive the power from on high, and then go in my name. And that power is ours too, if we wait for it with open, longing hearts. Well, it's your choice. You too could hear Jesus say, Peace be with you. You too could receive his love, his hope, his purpose, his power. If you'd like to hear more of Jesus' res resurrection invitation to you, why not, if you're on, watching online, send a message to the church after the service, or if you're here, speak to Chris. Or you could uh, join the short uh, course Hope Explore that you just heard about earlier. Just the second session, but lots more to discover of the implication of Jesus' resurrection for you. How dreadful if the disciples had been so consumed with grief that they couldn't lift up their head and see Jesus stand amongst them. Please, don't slip away afterwards without having a word. Well, if Jesus is standing amongst us, what should be our response to him? The disciples give us some clues in the next few verses in the book of Acts, which follows. Firstly, they recommit themselves to following him as his disciples, delighting in his presence, drinking in his words, following him at his call out to Bethany, where he physically leave, leaves them. Secondly, they wait for his gifts, and while they wait, they worship. Thirdly, they receive his power and his presence through the coming of his Holy Spirit, though it comes in unexpected ways. Fourthly, they accept his commission to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. So how about you, as a congregation? Can you reaffirm your commitment to be Jesus' disciple, basking in his presence, drinking in his word, choosing to receive and establish yourself in his peace, his love, his joy, his hope? Will you commit yourselves to the gospel, this amazing good news, the one that he offers, the peace that he offers, not the one that the world would prefer, the good news that he shares, not the one that the world usually trusts in? Will you open your homes for his worship and for studying his word? Will you accept his commission to be his witnesses? Will you go on offering your time, your finances, your resources for Jesus to use to extend his welcome and expand his kingdom? Will you commit to welcoming new life and to seek to follow Jesus in all his holiness of life and with a vision to reach out for him into your community in this lost and broken generation? As I arrived at CPS four years ago, CPS was also going through a time of recommitment and refreshing of our vision. As I'll say a bit more about later, CPS was founded 186 years ago with a vision to enable every man, woman and child in this country to hear the gospel through their local church. As our leaders thought and prayed about this, asking the Spirit to guide them, the words which Jesus spoke to the crowd about Zacchaeus became particularly important. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. But it could just as easily have been the verses at the end of this passage. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning right here. 
and you are witnesses of these things. These words were like a clarion call, reminding us of CPS with fresh urgency that Jesus is wanting to bring his gospel of love, forgiveness, healing, transformation and eternal life to every person in the country. And that isn't going to happen without Christ's churches rediscovering how to share their faith with their families, their friends and their neighbours. So we've been reaffirming our original commitment to evangelism. We just long to see every church a pathway to faith, every leader a catalyst for evangelism, every Christian a courageous witness, and for every child a chance to discover about Jesus for themselves. It would be a tragedy, wouldn't it, if a church remained locked in its upper room? But we want, don't we, to see every church become a pathway to faith in Jesus. And there are many things clamouring for the attention of our church leaders, Zoom calls and meetings and emails, but surely the people of our city and our country need one thing above all from them, that our leaders be reminding and encouraging and, ignore and, and organising their congregations to reach out effectively with the gospel good news. We need every leader, a catalyst, for evangelism. Yet, neither church nor church leader can deliver the welcome and invitation of Jesus to the millions who never cross the threshold of the church. It needs all of us, courageously, if not yet confidently, to share what we know of Jesus with those we meet in our homes, our streets, our offices, our schools and our clubs. Every Christian, a courageous witness. And we know that most adults come to faith not as an adult, but as a child. The opportunities for evangelism are much more potent among children. So we long for every child to have a chance to discover about or even meet Jesus. So, CPS, we've been refocusing our three major ministries in that direction, looking to raise extra funding and to concentrate our resources around some big audacious goals over these five years. In patronage, for instance, that's my area, we want to offer 60 newly appointed vicars the support during their first couple of years to shape their new leadership around vision and growth and evangelism. In our leadership development team, we hope to equip a thousand ministers and focal leaders, whether they're ordained or not, whether they're leading churches or multi-parish benefices, whether congregations or fresh expressions to enable their churches to become more effective in evangelism, so as each congregation sees more people becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. In Venture and Falcon Holidays, we want to invite 5,000 children from years 4 and 5 in Church of England schools to explore the Gospel through the School Venture Residentials programme, and also to draw in their local parish churches. So there's another result will be that these churches too are growing their children's ministries. And then our biggest, scariest goal of all, building on 180 years of creative resourcing of evangelism, we want to do the research and find the partners that will show us how to build the motivation, the competence and the courage of 50,000 Christians across the country to share their faith with those around them. So, we would love to see your PCC doing the PCC Tonight module on evangelism. Some of your leaders joining our Leading in Evangelism Learning Hub. And as a result of all of this, across the country, we hope to see thousands of people discovering the truth of Jesus' resurrection in their lives and on the lips of Christians and congregations and hearing Jesus say through them, Peace be with you. So may I offer you a challenge, that you join with us by praying regularly for us, by continuing and increasing your regular financial support for us, by encouraging your local church school to take part in a school venture and inviting young people that you know on a venture or folk and holiday, by praying for your leaders to have the gospel challenge on their heart, so that you too may reach out for, the, for our challenge. Every church, this church, a pathway to faith. Every leader, these leaders, a catholic for evangelism. Every Christian, 
We Christians are courageous witness. And for every child, our children here, a chance to discover about Jesus. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came to stand among the disciples in their grief, showing those signs of your suffering for them and your risen life. Some of us listening in today are longing to know your peace, your joy, your hope. Call us to touch your hands and feet. Fill us with your spirit. Others of us know that you've already come amongst us. Give us the courage to go on responding as joyfully and wholeheartedly as the disciples, offering you not just our homes, but our resources and our lives. And for all of us here in Leicester, may we be your witnesses. May this church be a pathway to faith in you. May our leaders be a catalyst for evangelism. May we all be more courageous in our witness to you. And may the children in our church, in our local schools and in the community around us have the chance to meet you for themselves. That we may continue to bring you glory in the days to come.